So this is the new score which I want. Just wanted to familiarize that, and uh, these links are available in the presentation. You can uh, click the link and then see. So let us see the other new uh, score, which is called the COVID gram. COVID gram, just like echocardiogram, there is a COVID gram of uh, uh, critical illness. Can you see? If you are not able to see, kindly tell me one of you. I'll be changing the um, in tabs. Obviously, you should be able to see. So, but let me know whether if I am not able, not visible, you let me know. Okay. Now, what is this COVID gram score? So, this is very important for us to know the uh, comprehensive parameters involving the lung. Is there an X-ray abnormality or not? Let us say the patient has already got X-ray abnormality. Let us say the patient's age is let us say sixty-five years. Does he have aptitis? No. Does he have dyspnea? Yes. Is he unconscious? No. Number of comorbidities present. Uh, one comorbidity, two comorbidities. What are the comorbidities? They are listed here: hypertension, diabetes, CKD, CAD, uh, all these things. You know, whatever is that? Let us say two comorbidities. And then you see the cancer history. Anything is there? Let us say no. And then you also look for the neutrophil count, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. We know here lymphocytes are very much depleted. What is the normal neutrophil lymphocyte ratio? Normally, neutrophils, let us say, are around eighty percent, seventy percent, and lymphocytes are thirty percent. We see around two. Let us say this patient has got three ratio of three. Lactic dehydration is a very important marker of the lung, and uh, let us say his lactic dehydration is two eighty, and slightly on the higher side. Bilirubin, we have to convert from millimoles to milligrams. Let us say it is one milligram. There is no liver involvement. What happened ultimately? 173.76.2 percent risk of critical illness in this patient, as defined by the intensive care unit protocol, and he may require invasive ventilation and chances of death also quite high. High risk group. So this is to triage the patient into high risk or low risk or whatever is the risk. And uh, what is the problem here in this? Why there is such a high risk? We said X-ray is abnormal. Let's say we change the X-ray to normal. So it's all suddenly 146 points it has come down. Still, it is in the high risk. Let us say the his age is let us say 35 instead of 65. 127 points. It has immediately moved to medium risk. Same thing. Let's say he doesn't have any breathlessness. Then again 113 points. Let us say he doesn't have any comorbidity at all. Then it's much less medium risk. And like that, you can calculate and ca cancer history. You no. Know? Neutrophil count, let us say, is two, is one point five. It's a very good predictor. So, like that, LDH also we are let, let's say we are reducing it to six seventy or eighty. So, so that is how the risk is triaged. Depending on the parameters, you can enter the various values, and of course, confirmed suspected, likely or unlikely. That is the uh, classification of the COVID, but it doesn't have any bearing on the. And the outcome. This applies to almost all pneumonias. This course. That is why they are not COVID specific, but uh, all the same. Certain parameters like LDH, DDMR, and uh, these are marked in our uh, particular disease here. Now, what are Berlin criteria? Yesterday we have seen Berlin criteria for uh, respiratory diseases. There must be within one week there must be an infection. Chest X-ray should show opacity. Respiratory failure not explained by Other causes like cardiac failure, those we have to take. Then let us say if there is objective assessment of echo, excludes hydrostatic uh, edema, and risk factor for ARD is present. Let's say we click that risk factor is present, and severity we PaO2 by FiO2. Let us say is between 100 and 200, which is a moderate level of uh, this one. Then we know it is positive for ARD and moderate. ARD. So this is to know whether the patient is going in for ARD or not. Let's say we all these things we say none of the above here, and then we go for the my PA water by FI water is normal. Then the risk for ARDS is not there because he didn't have any ARDS features in the X-ray and the clinically, and no objective heart failure or anything. And PA water by FI water is uh, between 200 and 300, and uh, he doesn't stand any risk of ARDS at this point. That doesn't mean that they should be stopped monitoring. 
So keep on updating the score and uh, regularly you monitor and classify the patient. So dynamic thing. So these are important things. Then what is the ROX? ROX is whether I should intubate the patient or not. It's a very important decision to make because we know once the patient is intubated, the outcomes are not that good. And many of the patients today are giving in writing, whatever may be the treatment you do, do doctor, but don't put me under intubation and uh, prolonged uh, bedridden status. I don't want. They're giving in writing. In such a case, we have to take their uh, sort of I mean, consent like that. And this is what is called the medical will. Just like you give a will for your property, Today, there is a provision legally to give a medical will. How long you wanted to be observed on the ICU? How, what are the terminal events you would like to do uh, by the medical people? All those things we can document and uh, put a legal document also. This is called the medical will. So any lawyer should be able to help. There are health lawyers who are familiar with these uh, terminologies. And uh, we can always write, you know, organ donation issues. And all those things will come in that. So better all of us, you know, are about 60 years write a medical will also, how we want our body to be disposed of and how it should be treated when we are not able to take decisions. So this is exactly the medical will, just like your property. Keep that in mind, that is a little away from today's subject, but nonetheless is important for all of us. Let us see whether a given patient requires a sort of intubation. If the SPO2 is 95 to 100, let us say a patient has got 88, so already desaturating on room air, and then the FIO2 that is inspired oxygen already we is receiving 60% oxygen let us say he is receiving already by the NIV or the catheter and his respiratory rate is 35 or 30, 32 let us say. Now you see he is raised 4.8 points this is called the ROX index. Patient should be reassessed within 2 hours and the index calculated. Right now you don't require to intubate and after 2 hours you redo the whole exercise. Now I'll do, I'll just change the things. I'll say the respiratory rate is 40 instead of 32. Now what happened? The patient is a risk of a high HFNC failure is high. Intubation may be considered. Or I, I have increased the FI over to 100. So even on 100% oxygen, room A, the, uh, this one, risk of HN failure and intubation high. So the parameters that decide are what is the current oxygen saturation, what is the amount of oxygen he is breathing in, and what is his respiratory rate. These are the three parameters which tell you whether a patient requires intubation or not. Everything is today you now so sort of uh, uh, crystal clear, and one need not uh, take a sort of casual decision or, uh, or a sort of uh, uh, calculated decision uh, has to be taken and informed about this to the individual families and uh, the patient is conscious to the patient also why we wanted to intubate him and uh, things like that. So these are some of the things that I wanted to show you on the calculators apart from four or five other calculators which I have shown you yesterday. The quick uh, score of the COVID and also we looked at the uh, SIC that is for the coagulopathy and all the scores, four or five scores I have shown. Today I am showing the four and another important thing you might be interested to know is what is called the Cytosorbent Symposium has occurred. And luckily I was part of that symposium, online symposium, it was conducted in June. So I attended the Cytosorbent Symposium. What is Cytosorbent? Cytosorbent is sorb means absorb, cyto means cytokine, cytokine absorbent symposium. There is one technique called the Cytosorb. Cytos as you can see here, the Cytosorb. It is a machine, I mean, sort of a wire-like thing through which the blood is passed and it is connected into the uh, your uh, sort of uh, ECMO circuit itself. The ECMO circuit will be going on and this is in between interposed, this wire-like thing and the absorbent material will absorb the cytokines. Look, sounds very nice. If all the cytokines are absorbed and the blood is returned without the cytokines, the chances of recovery of the patient should be very high. Theoretically, sounds very nice. But the problem is cytokines are not one-time FI. Cytokines are secreted today and you are trying to absorb and then again the cytokines will be produced. Unless the production factory is shut down in the lung, the cytokines keep on coming. So this doesn't replace the treatment for uh, cytokine replacement, I mean, uh, cytokine storm, like your steroids or tocilizumab or hydrolizumab or whatever you are using. In addition to that, of course, you can use cytosorb also as a, an additional device. 
and provided uh, if, if it works in 2 to 3 days the patient is stabilized and it is fine this is the 30 minute video youtube video uh, three or four speakers are there they, you can see the speakers here rational for cytosol cytokine absorption in severe covid first clinical experience in usa reduction of hyperinflammation septic shock multi organ failure can we do it better there are four speakers in this each around 10 minutes they were presenting so you can just uh, look at a little listen to that uh, just one or two minutes and then see how it is and this link i am sharing so i'm not going to present that uh, today for you so that you will be able to look at the thing cytokine uh, level elevation and also with cytokine storm so a special form of hyper inflammation we still work on characterizing this hyper inflammation these are people who are actually handling the cytokine uh, treatment all over the world. Is, uh, beneficial so how this will be very useful and uh, in fact there was a uh, manipal hospital main hospital in hcl road has started this uh, cytokine uh, absorption treatment there the principle is somewhat similar to plasma pharesis principle is somewhat similar to dialysis where you remove the unnecessary molecules here but the chemicals used to absorb the cytokines are uh, quite different so this is a little bit about the cytorb or cytosorb or cytokine absorption technique now i am going to share you the another screen which will come uh, which will bring me to some more important things now so i'll uh, try to share those things many things are there we'll quickly try and go through that so okay one by one i'll uh, show you can you see my screen yes sir no we are seeing we are able to see okay very good sir thank you thanks for the feedback now uh, this is about the treatment the, what i'm going to now do is yesterday we discussed uh, four important frontline treatments in moderate and severe covid number one of course is your uh, treatment with oxygen and decisions to give what type of oxygen and intubation and things like that number two is suppress the cytokines by steroids and also tocilizumab in selected cases Number three, give anticoagulations to see the thromboinflammation is controlled. And uh, <coughs> number four is the antiviral agents. So today we are going to, what we are going to do in today's symposium is the evidence-based medicine. So this is where watch word today, evidence-based medicine. Is there evidence for the interventions we are, so-called interventions we are using? There are two types of, uh, three types of authorizations. One is the regular authorization by the FDA and also by the drug controller and the other organizations in India, this, uh, wherein there is no special permission is required except the people who are qualified to give them only should use. The second type of authorization is what is called the emergency use authorization, EUA. This is certain drugs are approved even though there is no robust evidence, there is likely that it will benefit and emergency use authorizations are permitted. The third category of people are those uh, third category of people, uh, third category of evidence is that compassionate grounds. Compassionate grounds means there is nothing that you do can do the patient and if it works, let it work. That is something like a compassionate grounds. mandu So that is, there is no evidence based here, but then this has to be very clearly explained to the patients and their written consent is absolutely essential when we use EUA or, uh, or the other one that is the compassionate grounds. So keeping that in the background of the mind, we will just look at the cytokine storm. And I'm not going to read the entire paper. I have highlighted also this paper, some parts of it. I will see the clinical immunological pathological features of COVID storm. As you can see here, the this is an NHC publication. Uh, the NHC is the National Health Commission of People's Republic of China. It defines uh, COVID-19 is one of the following conditions, respiratory rate of more than 30, oxygen saturation less than 96, arterial blood PO2 by FiO2 is less than 300. We are dealing with somewhat moderate to severe COVID here. Critical illness is one, one of the following conditions. 
with uh, respiratory failure and then requiring mechanical ventilation complications of other organ failures needs to intensive care so this is the type of patients on which this trial is conducted severe and uh, moderately severe and moderately severe and severe patients and also critical patients so 14% of patients progress to severe disease 5% to critical illness and also the prospective study reported that the computerized tomography of the lungs of the covid patient and the lung lesions increase and the scope expands as the disease progresses as we have seen earlier ground glass opacities are the commonest form so the what did they do they, they are also measuring here the cd3 and cd4 cd3 plus and cd4 plus counts along with the cd8 and uh, cd3 these are some of the t cell markers that we are doing of course we are also using crp as one of our markers interleukin 1 now i6 interleukin 6 is also very important one interleukin 10 also is done in some studies but interleukin 6 appears to be more uh, elevated in this particular uh, pandemic about half of the studies were collected also had tumor necrosis factor alpha so what are the cytokines they are looking at crp and then the interleukin uh, 6 and of course the t, t cell markers now let us see what are the findings of that cytokine absorption devices this is what they are talking about just now we looked at that they use some patients along with the ecmo the cytosorb cytosorbents of the new jersey that is what we discussed and uh, initially there was a lot of uh, noise about hydroxychloroquine and uh, as an immuno modulator or immuno suppressor and we still know that it is it works in a few i mean selected patients particularly in the early disease intravenous immunoglobulin is one thing which is coming up this is a lab made immunoglobulin apart from your uh, dexamethasone and uh, tocilizumab and new treatments are being tried anti malarial so artemisinins you know artemisinins are standard anti malarial treatments and they are they are also now nowadays on trials so this is how the study went and the final uh, i mean conclusion of this paper as you can see here, uh, here here the elevation of these inflammatory markers are found and uh, inflammatory marker reduction is not mortality reduction that is what we need to understand we can only uh, reduce the suffering and probably the time to ventilation also is cut down and discharge also is a little earlier now I, i you need to know about the this particular paper this is called the chick study what is chick study Uh, historically compo- comparison of the historical comparison of glucocorticoids with and without tocilizumab so people with glucocorticoid whether they are along with tocilizumab is it better or not better so this is the chick study a very popular study among the tocilizumab studies the objective is of the prospectively investigate patients with covid-19 associated cytokine storm syndrome called the css where an intensive course of glucocorticoids with and without tocilizumab accelerates the clinical improvement reduces mortality and prevents invasive mechanical ventilation in comparison to the historical group where tocilizumab is not used so that is the abstract part and i am not going to the details and what is already known about the subject covid-19 presents with cytokine storm we know that but second thing is what does this study add this strongly in involving a course of high dose glucocorticoids followed by tocilizumab if needed has shown to accelerate respiratory recovery lower respiratory lower the respiratory mortality and reduce the likelihood of invasive mechanical ventilation these are the outcomes of this how might this impact the clinical practice cssc cytokine uh, storm should be recognized and considered as a treatable complication of covid and having done that whatever the armamentarians we have we have glucocorticoids yesterday we dis- discussed at length so initially we give the, as the patient is admitted on the 6th 7th day we give him dexamethasone 68 mg iv for about a week or so then switch on to oral in addition to that in selected patients we can also think of using that tocilizumab so that is the outcome of the study i'm not going to go into further details i'm going to share or share all these references with you the earlier one about the cytokine and also the that is the nhc study from china this is a chick study from the european country so this also i am now uh, let us see the recovery trial what is recovery trial recovery trial is one of the very famous trials now in in terms of uh, covid treatment now and this is a european trial and uh, luckily this gentleman you can see the name here i am enlarging there by name peter horbe 
he conducted a webinar along with his uh, other uh, teammates who are doing the recovery trial and there are some recovery trial is also part of the intake is from other countries there were a few from the other countries also who were the investigators there were four participants in that webinar i was lucky to be part of that and what was discussed uh, is i am summarizing here of course that is there also they have published later on in this particular uh, paper so this is a controlled open label trial comparing a range of possible treatments uh, for patients hospitalized with covid randomly assigned this is a randomized control trial remember it's one of the very good randomized trials patients to receive oral or iv dexamethasone 6 mg as the one arm on 10 days and primary outcome was 28 day mortality and the control group did not receive the they received the steroid so you can see here the total of 201 2104 patients are assigned to dexamethasone and the double the number is assigned to usual care without dexamethasone and then 22.9% in the dexamethasone and 25.7% in the care group died the mortality is almost similar but 28 days after randomization but the age adjusted confidence intervals are favoring the dexamethasone p value is 0.001 now let us look at the conclusions in patients hospitalized with covid the use of dexamethasone resulted in lower mortality slightly among those who were receiving either invasive mechanical ventilation or oxygen alone at randomization but not among those receiving respiratory no respiratory support so what does this mean if a patient my patient is a mild case he is not on any respiratory support giving dexamethasone adds no value giving dexamethasone to moderate cases with oxygen administration either no mask or nasal prong or high flow nasal or niv or an intubation if you give the steroid the outcomes are better so this is the evidence that we have so you can see here it's a beautiful study uh, nice to look at all the data 11000 patients were screened and after all the exclusions we have, they have boiled down to 2104 in the treatment arm and 4321 in the control arm so this in the reference also i'm going to share with you to show that dexamethasone does work where not in mild cases we are not supposed to give dexamethasone in mild cases as general practitioners we all will be tempted to start dexamethasone on the very first day when you make the diagnosis also please don't do that there is no international recommendation to do that but if the patient has got couple of comorbidities if he is dyspneic if he is desaturating if he qualifies for a mild case the mild to moderate he moves even 2a moderate without oxygen desaturation you are justified in giving that so that is the message as far as the recovery trial is concerned now the other trial which is published in the, the is a review article actually they have looked at all the cytokine storm studies and then published a review article always review articles will be very useful because we need not have to go to each individual article and they, you can just see the abstract here aim and objective is the cytokine storm or cytokine release syndrome or uh, cytokine uh, associated css or crs all mean the same is an inevitable in severe and critically ill patients with novel coronavirus and this review aims to discuss the current therapeutic option for the management of crs in covid cytokine storm is caused by the collagen release of the pro inflammatory cytokines interleukin 2 6 and uh, trimonacus factor alpha and of course the dysregulated uh, production of these things because the t cell regulator gene is switched off and hyperimmune response this is a situation of hyperimmune response body is trying to do more harm by producing this immunity rather than sort of immuno response rather than the any beneficial effect this is rather a phenomenon of overkill we call it as phenomenon of overkill this immunopathogenesis leads to acute lung injury ali and acute respiratory distress syndrome ardis so targeting the cytokine storm with therapies that already available in india with support of published guidelines this is what is uh, this one. then let us look at the results the review results of so we predominantly included published guidelines and consensus recommendations for the management of cytokine storm from the existing literature evidence observed that currently available agents are low dose corticosteroids heparin can be beneficial in managing cytokine storm you may ask me how heparin works heparin reduces the thrombo inflammation once the thrombosis is reduced automatically the cytokine storm also is benefited there is a benefit by the heparin uh, anti heparin also that the heparin also by preventing the clotting and they there is they use also serine protease inhibitors like uh, ulinastatin this is a, a special statin 
uh, Ulina statin, and this is being tried, and probably this could be one of the game changers. That is what people are saying. And uh, high dose vitamin K, vitamin C, and then interleukin six inhibitors like tocilizumab have been reviewed. And the conclusions are: current management of COVID is preventive and supportive. Different therapies can be used to prevent and treat cytokine storm. More research is needed for further supporting the use of newer treatments. The established ones are corticosteroids and the tocilizumab in selected cases. JAK inhibitors and NK1 inhibitors are being tried, but not with much success in different uh, studies. So that's about the, this paper. So let us go and look at the. Uh, recommendations for the evidence base for the low molecular weight so this is a thrombotic uh, therapy for this is from the thrombotic society of america and then uh, very uh, updated guidelines are coming on this thing and uh, these are the various treatment options and you can read through the paper thoroughly but i just give you the highlighted area i will show you non hospitalized patients with covid should not be routinely tested for measures of coagulopathy what does that mean suppose my patient is there who is mild and young fellow didn't have any symptoms or asymptomatic or very mild illness mild cough fever for 2 3 days tested positive there is no point in ordering all the host of battery of all the tests and then looking at them we will be tempted to do that but if somebody is more than 65 has got comorbidities you are always justified to do this test like a red eye mark prothrombin fibrinogen and platelet count and lymphocytes particularly these abnormal these are the markers associated with worse outcome and there is a lack of prospective data demonstrating that they can be used for risk stratification and hematological coagulation parameters are commonly measured in all hospitalized patients every 5 days if the patient is stable every other day if the patient is not stable this is where, where whom to be tested second thing is who are managed as out patients for non hospitalized patients anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy should not be initiated for venous thromboembolism prophylaxis or therapeutic doses unless there are other indications for giving anticoagulation somebody is having atrial fibrillation already is an anticoagulation you can continue there nothing wrong in that for example hospitalized patient those are admitted vta prophylaxis should be given unless there is a contraindication just the reverse of that this has to be used here should not be used there unless there is indicated you don't use that unless contraindicated you don't know, you don't stop using that what do what do i give yesterday we have discussed at length those things and uh, patients on covid who experience an incidental thromboembolic event also should be treated and the, here the therapeutic dose has to be used so anticoagulation is here two types preventive type and the therapeutic type prophylactic type for everybody who is admitted therapeutic type when there is a mild indication of thromboembolic event occurring in the body so therapeutic dose is double the preventive dose instead of 40 mg of enoxaparin we give 80 mg instead of 0.3 loaded syringe we give 0.6 loaded syringe so how about discharging the patients here exactly the diversity is there some hospitals some guidelines are telling we need to give them for at least a month uh, some people are saying no 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 without any indication don't give it all at the in the discharge some people are saying no no via media maybe give for two weeks oral drug like you know apixaban or or dabigatran or whatever is the uh, is the drug that you choose so this is routine post discharge vta prophylaxis is not recommended as per these guidelines but in our country we are discharging patients in most of the institution uh, with a prescription of oral anticoagulant Uh, like epixaban for a period of four, 14 days after the discharge that is about the lmwh and this one so the another uh, recommendation for that here you can see in this publication uh, ed and ambulatory care ward based high dependent unit hdus renal replacement people step down everywhere you know there is no evidence to, to give in the op setup or in the out patient i mean at home treatment but of course there is indication to give once they are admitted and uh, of course tested also we discussed antiplatelet agents have got no role to prevent the particular embryo the disease here but of course if they are already on antiplatelet we have to continue now i'm going to show you about the placid trial what is placid trial placid trial is one of the largest trials of convalescent plasma you can see convalescent plasma in the management of moderate covid in india in open a very large trial open labeled parallel arm trial and uh, of course uh, multi center randomized control trial 
So uh, the patients are assigned randomly to either plasma conventional treatment or the convalescent plasma. You can see the list of hospitals involved and the investigators here, a huge number of investigators have participated in the trial. All these people have participated in the, this large trial. People who are uh, different, different categories of uh, physicians and uh, working in different setups, different states, uh, different medical colleges and uh, private institutions. A huge list of people are involved in the plastic trial. Okay, all this is good. Then what is the finding? That's what we are interested to know. Let's go and look at that. So the abstract says that convalescent plasma, which is called CP here, has a passive source of neutralizing antibody. What is the logic here? A patient who recovered from COVID, he, will, he would have mounted the antibody response. And these antibodies could be effective in neutralizing the viral antigens in a new patient or an acute patient. So these are also immunomodulators. This is a sensory world of sensory world therapeutic option. We use, you know, ATS was there, uh, anti-rabies immunoglobulin. All these things are passive immunizations only. But the only thing is there the and there the antibody is extracted and given here the plasma itself is given. That is the difference. Open label, parallel along, phase two, multicentric RCT. 39 public and private hospitals across India. More than 120 investigators participated. And here the definition is if PaO2 by FiO2 is between 200 to 300, respiratory rate is more than 24, SpO2 or less than 93. That means these are not the patients who are in the home isolation or in the uh, sort of outpatient care. Okay, what do I give? The participants are randomized to either control, that is called the best of care, that is best standard care BSC, or the uh, standard care plus CP, which is the convalescent plasma. How much I give? 200 ml of two doses of plasma are given, transfused 24 hours apart in the intervention group. So composite progression of severe disease, all-cause mortality, and then and then the post-COVID enrollment, what, what happened to the results? Let us see. So uh, 464 patients were enrolled, 235 and 229 in the respective groups, 235 in the intervention arm and 229 in the control arm. Okay, definitely all, all these case criteria we have defined. And then we are also saying that uh, what happened to the patients we wanted to see. Mortality is documented in 34, that is 14.5% in the intervention group and 13.5% in the control group, in the intervention and control arm respectively, which puts us the odds ratio of 1.06, which is not significant. So there is no mortality benefit. CP was not associated with reduction in the mortality or progression to severe COVID. This trial has high generalizability because people from various hospitals, various states have been included and then it is a randomized trial. Approximates almost a real life setting of the uh, plasma system. Who would have treated 500 patients you know, for plasma? So this is one of the very important landmark studies. And this says that giving calm in plasma is of not much benefit. But then if at all some institutions still decide to do it, they are doing uh, on a, what is called the, the compassionate grounds, uh, this one, and they have to do it very early. If I want to give convalescent plasma in the third week, what is the use? Already virus multiplication has stopped. So all the antivirals, convalescent plasma, all those are required when actually the virus is multiplying, which should be... Uh, we have to be doing in the first week or uh, the second week, uh, beginning of the second week like that. So it's only a two day course. <coughs> now, I'm going to take you through the, how much time is left? 20 minutes. ECMO report, I'm going to show you what is this ECMO. So this is a beautiful graph and uh, the, this is a pool data of ECMO on many patients that are treated. This is not about one hospital or anything. This is called the ECMO registry. So we don't have ECMO that frequently available in our country. Now, of course, it is available. So multiple major health organizations recommended the use of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. What is ECMO? ECMO is instead of the lung oxygenating the blood, the machine oxygenates. Just like the dialysis machine removes the bad elements of the 
renal excretory products there here the lung function is we have to travel uh, allow the oxygen into the blood and get the carbon dioxide back this is called the pulmonary respiration there is another respiration going on in our body which is called the tissue respiration so for example the blood comes to my kidney then all the cells of my kidney have to give away their carbon dioxide and take the oxygen in this is called the tissue respiration extra corporeal membrane oxygenation will not do anything to with the tissue oxygenation that is the body has to each individual body has to do by themselves whereas the lung part of it can be probably done it is something like a heart lung bypass only in addition we are also introducing here oxygenation of the blood and sending back to the this so uh, the data is from 1035 patients not small number thousand patients on ecmo what happened to them it's very interesting for us to know what is the experience of this thousand patient who are treated in this registry ecmo support were included in the study 67 Our six percent remained still in the hospital at the time of writing the report, and thirty percent were discharged home uh, or to an acute rehabilitation center, and ten percent were discharged uh, to a long-term care center, unspecified location. Seventeen percent were discharged, and some thirty-seven percent died. In spite of ECMO being given, out of the thousand fellows, roughly forty percent of people died. and around 6% continued to remain in the hospital remaining were in various levels of care the estimated cumulative incidence of in hospital mortality 90 day mortality is anywhere between 34 to 40 so you can now take that a patient is on ecmo there is a 40% chance of the patient not surviving the mortality was around 39% so the use of ecmo for circulatory support was independently associated with higher in, in hospital mortality so not only the the ecmo itself is is one cause for the mortality in some of the patients when other parameters are normal now we can see that particular interpretation here in patients with covid 19 who received ecmo both estimated mortality at 90 days after ecmo and the mortality in those who with the final disposition of death or discharge was around 40% this data from 213 hospitals worldwide provide a generalizable estimate of ecmo mortality in a given setting but of course a given patient uh, prognosis is dependent upon the associated comorbidities if somebody is very obese somebody is already hypertensive ischemic heart disease on dialysis is a liver failure patient whatever you do you know the lung uh, part you are doing that issue sir Uh, the tissue respiration is not occurring that's what i am telling ecmo is not something like then you know, it's a miracle god is giving uh, oxygen and uh, support for 90 days okay you are oxygenating in the membrane here but what happens to the tissue respiration that has to be looked into that is dependent upon the comorbidities the age and other thing this is a very beautiful way of representing what happens to the patient you can see here the color coded the green one are all hospitalized from 0 to 90 days as you go down the greenness is coming down that means people either are discharged or are dead after 30 days majority of them the outcome is either this way or that way after about 30 to 40 days now you see this is all the deaths here initially there were no deaths but as the time progresses if they are not responding they are more likely to die okay discharged home also the commensurately as more, i mean goes time goes by they are being discharged discharge to home or rehab discharge from the hospital and unknown status what happened to these people we don't know where they went they went out of the hospital on their own and they, they, they never knew what happened to them so in a way we can say that if you give a good try of ecmo by around 30 to 40 days the outcome is either you get discharged from the hospital or the person uh, succumbs to the disease so that is the cut off point somebody who can afford to have the ecmo for about 30 days which costs around 2 lakh rupees per day in a good institution so 30 days will be around 60 to 70 lakhs on ecmo alone plus other uh, treatments and all it comes to more than a crore and uh, the reasonable try is around 30 days at 30 40 days if he is not responding or if the other organs are failing then there is nothing much that you can do this is the story about the ecmo now i wanted to share a little about the lung transplantation yesterday uh, the question has been asked when you want to do lung transplantation list here the 10 considerations we believe should be carefully weighed when assessing a patient with covid this is called lung transplant registry for covid patients 
So this is the specific group of people who are working on COVID and lung transplant. So uh, the ARDS is the indication here. The following factors have to be considered. First, candidate should be younger than 65. Okay, existing experience from ECMO bridge. ECMO is a bridge treatment. Bridge treatment to lung transplant shows poorer outcomes for older patients. They were maintained on ECMO. When the transplant is available, the lung is transplanted. So, but then the first condition is you should be less than 65. Beyond that, the outcomes are poor. Second, candidates for transplantation should have only a single organ dysfunction. That is the lung dysfunction alone. If there is other organ dysfunction, uh, we will not be able to consider. For example, the famous singer Balasubramanyam, there are a lot of rumors going on. He is being given lung transplantation. He is not a candidate because his morbid obesity is there and the age is not in his favor. Who will take him for lung transplant? And obviously, we know it is a rumor. So, that is the thing. The third one is sufficient time should be allowed for the lung to recover on the mechanical ventilation. That means today I have put the tube, tomorrow I am going to lung transplant. No, that's not like that. We have to give him the sufficient time for the lung to recover. At least around 15-20 days of good intensive care treatment with intubation. And of course, check point if it is available. And then if the patient is not responding, then the question of this one will be considered. The fourth one is, should be radiological evidence of irreversible lung disease. Suppose the lungs are normal. Where is the point in giving lung transplantation? He's going to die of something else, either cytokines or thromboembolic complication or sepsis or something else. He is dying and not because of the lung. So here, what are the two things that I need to look at? Severe bullous destruction and evidence of fibrosis. If one of, one of, the, one of two of them are there, then it is an indication for the lung transplantation. Fifth one is patient should be awake and we should be able to give a consent about the transplant and discussion because transplant means lifelong immunosuppression. So you should not wake up after that you have given me transplant, my dear, but the bill for my uh, immunosuppression and the risks are so high, you should have told me to do this. So during that, if patient is not in a condition to give a consent, usually this is not taken up by the advice by the, by, by the children or any family member. Sixth one, patient should be able to participate in physical rehabilitation after the transplantation because the lung transplantation means a lot of rehabilitation is required. Seventh one is patient should fulfill typical criteria of transplantation like, you know, BMI and comorbidities and coronary artery disease and all that. Eighth one, he must be COVID negative from the intrabronchial and pulmonary secretions. If he is positive, there is no point in doing that. And ninth one is the transplantation center should have a substantial experience of high risk transplantations. We can't just like do in any hospital uh, which can do ordinary lung transplant. The center should have access to the broad donor pool and a waiting list also is, uh, is there. And yeah, this is not something like a lab manufactured lung or a plastic lung. This is the sort of live donor you have to get from somebody who is an accident victim or whatever it is and use the lungs. So these are the issues related to lung, lung transplantation. Remember that it is an option for a very few patients. Now I'm going to show you some important uh, uh, things, you know, all Indian Institute of Medical Science and then CMC. Uh, should we use hydroxychloroquine as prophylaxis in healthcare workers? The other day, Dr. Masun Babugar has discussed, the, asked this question and we discussed, yes, we have to use and of course this doesn't replace the PPE kit and other protective practices. Can I use ivermectin? The answer is no, because the doses that we require ivermectin are 48 milligrams and above in vitro and that dose is not tolerated by the individual. It can be used for strangled doses or other parasitic infections and not for co. Should we use anticoagulation therapy post this year? Here again, the, the all Indian should experience is they are uh, not giving uh, at the time of discharge. In Manipal hospital, they are giving for 14 days. In some institutions, they are giving for 30 days. Again, the cut is by the clinician who treats. And of course, weigh the risk benefit versus the benefit. Sudden cardiac death syndrome in COVID is occurring. We all know that sudden cardiac deaths are reported patient gets uh, into the emergency and suddenly dies. Reasons have been proposed to include sudden cardiac event or acute coronary syndrome or silent hypoxia or, or then the happy hypoxia syndrome. Methyl prednisolone versus dexamethasone. Nothing to choose between them. Standard is dexamethasone. If you want to use methyl prednisolone, there is no harm in that. Role of tocilizumab. DGCI, Director General of India, you know, control, direct control, uh, controller of drugs. He has approved this on a compassionate ground in the ongoing pandemic. However, tocilizumab is a very powerful immunosuppressant. 
So there should be no bacterial infection at the time of giving it. You should be monitoring it with the procalcitonin, leukocytes, and clinical symptomatology. And broad antibiotic cover is a must when you start on uh, tocilizumab, and uh, it cannot be repeated only single dose. Eight milligrams per kilogram body weight, maximum of two hundred, three hundred milligrams is given. And again, you know the evidence in literature is rather not convincing. That is why it is being approved on a compassionate ground. Plasma therapy. Uh, we have discussed at length the plasma therapy, and these also uh, Alan Institute also said there is no. It is an experimental therapy and should not be used. Role of flapinavir. Yesterday, some friend is asking about flapinavir. What Alan Institute says, you see, studies have used the flap uh, flapinavir mainly in mild and asymptomatic illness, claiming to prevent progression. Whereas majority of this cohort recover on their own. The people you are giving are mild illness, and even if you don't give, they are going to recover. How do you know that it is due to this one? Unless there is a randomized trial with and without that, there are no trials like that. Evidence is very weak for the use of flavipiravir, and currently is not recommended in the national guidelines or by the Allen Institute. Lower of antifibrotics in the prevention of lung fibrosis. There is no evidence to support that. Prevention of depression is of course a minor thing. Ramidesivir versus tocilizumab. Give it a ramidesivir and tocilizumab in a highly suspect patient with COVID negative result. No. This is not advocated. This should not be used. Somebody has got some lung features suggestive of COVID, and repeated tests are negative. And uh, there is no point in giving ramidesivir and uh, tocilizumab. The one indication is they must be positive. But they should be try methylene blue. No, the answer is very clearly all over the world. And there are uh, anecdotal experiences. People are saying it is working. Even one uh, senior anesthetist, anesthetist. Uh, who is dealing with covid for the last 6 months is that he had quite a few patients who recovered miraculously with methylene blue of course these are uncontrolled experiments and we cannot go back by that it is not science how long can we give of course 5 days and not beyond that ramidesivir and tocilizumab prophylactic known absolutely without positive itself we cannot give we can't use it as a prophylactic Relatives should be allowed to visit COVID patients. It's a very common question. No, relatives are not allowed to visit COVID patients as they have a chance to first infect themselves and transmit. But what if if the wife and husband both of them are positive? Very much yes, you can put them in the same room. That is the ideal scenario. Actually, some of my patients they had both of them are positive. One is a little severe. He is removed to the hospital. Wife also wanted to go. Okay, you go and stay along with him and be happy. That's not a problem. So uh, should we continue steroids on discharge? Yes. We have to continue steroids for at least five to six days, as per the guidelines. How do we maintain nutrition? When to shift to NIV? These are some of the answers. This is from the AM, AMS protocol, and this is what is called the CMC COVID protocol. CMC COVID protocol: they classified mild, moderate, and severe. Mild only had uh, you know the treat prophylactic treatment with anticoagulation is not given. D dimers are not checked. No count. These are the things, and then the moderate one. Consider enrollment in a clinical trial because there are ongoing trials in CNC pulse oximeter to be monitored. Day dimer should be, to be done and repeated every four days. Prophylactic anticoagulation, if no contraindication. Dexamethasone. Consider ramidesivir, and then raising day dimer if there is a, an evidence of uh, echo or Doppler evidence of thrombosis. This is what we all do. They also are following the same protocol. Severe patients again day dimer on admission, repeat every two days. That's what we do. Give prophylactic dose of anticoagulation and give dexamethasone. So more or less, you know the protocols of uh, government of India, the institutions across the uh, Indian institutions, others are matching one another. Everybody is scientifically treating. In addition, I have a few nuggets which I will share, and with that probably we will close this seminar uh, from my side. Other other lectures will be there. I I I was part of several webinars, uh, both as a speaker and as as well as a as a participant and more as a participant. Whatever I noted, I have just uh, summarized here. COVID nineteen was considered original originally viral pneumonia. All that you remove. Now what you have is uh, micro droplets. Is it by aerosol? Big question. Now still now the non not answered. Only by the contact or by the respiratory route droplet infection. So no masking to uh, mandatory masking in public has become the norm. Simple masks to N95 masking only when we go out. Now adds masking at all times in in case somebody is uh, uh, symptomatic or positive. Distance of three feet has become six feet. 
pandemic very high mortality start with now it is indian mortality is experience is around 1.3% from institutional care at least to 80% of people it is now 70 80% home care earlier days no treatments are available now we have dimers we have uh, we have the we have test for the dimer and other thing and we have the antivirals we have the anticoagulants we have the dexamethasone mandatory ventilation was the concept earlier and uh, which which is now changed to non invasive ventilation uh, earlier reproductive age women are reduced their uh, reduced severity is there patients have shifted to no steroids to early low dose steroids hydroxychloroquine uh, for not for all only for milder and selected cases and then thinking of death is now thinking of recovery no pool test and uh, pool tests are being done what is pool test you may have a concept supposing there is a community there is a, there are a family of 10 people and uh, you know closely associated and meeting each other instead of testing each individual all the 10 blood samples are fed to the pcr uh, and the, com- the combined blood samples if all 10 are negative it means none of them are positive okay that way you save lot of uh, money and then uh, if if it is positive then of course you test individually so this is to save time and also money ct has of no value earlier now ct is of good value ct values are important for us to know and ct here the ct is not the uh, not the chest ct here it is the ct that is a, a, the cycle time of the virus replication a low cycle time means a high viral load high cycle time means low viral load moving mode from rt pcr to rapid antigen test of course immunoglobulin testing antibodies is still not the answer so isolation to cohort isolation what is cohort isolation suppose four members in the family are positive each individual need not be in one room all of them can be in the same home with locked doors no oxygen to home oxygen so like that these are the various things that changed finally uh, you know mortality uh, two times that of the government figures is reported most of the mortalities they are not being recorded as covid mortalities stigma to less stigma low mortality to high mortality among doctors this the other day i was telling you the in one study they have published 38% of the doctors who are frontline warriors have succumbed uh, if you remove the younger age group if you include the younger age group it was around 22 23% so very high risk uh, sort of uh, profession we are in but then that's okay and then we have got one more last one these are probably the uh, important things from the manikal manipal kasturba medical college we had a webinar on that and uh, whatever i noted from them once covid is diagnosed based on the cbt lft rft crp d dimer interleukin ldh ferritin trop ecg baseline cxr and ct chest this summarizes what are all the investigations you required to do replication score that's what we discussed just now replication generally stops by the ninth day maximum by 14th day by the, after that no antiviral drug is of any benefit rt pcr earlier negative then you may have to repeat the rt pcr or use the ct scan rt pcr uh, may be false positive in the first four days the pathology of covid disease is that from inflammation which is not because of the virus immune inflammation and thromboid inflammation so it is called what is called frustrated phagocytosis the phagocytes macrophages dendritic cells the neutrophils are very active to engulf the virus but they are not able to do because the virus is resisting engulfing because it has changed certain certain of the determinants there the neotosis yesterday we talked about that and the, those are the ones which lead to frustrated phagocytosis and they secrete lot of cytokines so three important symptoms remember fever myalgia and exhaustion 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 very important patient complain i feel very different and very weak it's one common symptom and also the we see several post covid patient who are losing weight to the tune of 3 to 5 kilos so loss of weight is also very important steroids and anticoagulants are the cornerstone and uh, steroids we have discussed oral prednisolone or dexamethasone definitely steroids prevent of course also long term fibrosis anticoagulation 0.5 mg subcutaneously bd if the d dimer is normal it is double the dose if the d dimer is elevated that is a therapeutic dose so when to start treatment of course we know once the patient is in the moderate category moderate a okay now uh, 
ఆఫ్టర్ ఓరల్ యాంటీకోయాగులంటే కెన్ స్విచ్ స్విచ్ టు ఎఫ్సిక్స్ బ్యామ్ ఆర్ రెవరాక్స్ బ్యామ్ వాట్ ఎవర్ ఇస్ ది కన్వీనియంట్ డ్రగ్ ఫర్ యూ ఓరల్ డ్రగ్ ఫర్ ఫోర్ వీక్స్ ది కేఎంసి స్టెలింగ్ బట్ టూ వీక్స్ ఇస్ నార్మల్లీ యూజ్డ్ అండ్ సమ్ ఇన్స్టిట్యూషన్స్ ఆల్ ఇన్ ఇన్స్టిట్యూట్ సేస్ డోంట్ యూజ్ ఇన్ ది డిశ్చార్జ్ సినారియో ఓకే there is hypoxia for mandatory and methyl prednisolone hydroxychloroquine not trip, uh, not to be combined with ramdesivir this we have uh, emphasized very much dexa one course uh, for antiviral is finished uh, switch to oral dexa antiviral is going on iv dexa also iv once antiviral is over give to oral dexa methadone beware of the hyperglycemia in diabetics because that could be very troublesome to control once they are on the steroids is a preferable to prolong anticoagulation for 6 weeks if there is a requirement for the oxygen mandatory monitor crp day time or alternate day until the patient is stabilized interleukin 6 once in 5 days okay il6 is a mark, marker of impending cytokine storm access to tocilizumab tocilis you can always keep keep it handy in case you want to use you can use it so most dangerous period for the patients is between 8th and the 14th day interleukin 6 can return to normal with steroids and anticoagulation that is when most people die in the 18 to 14 days or they enter into the severe disease there are reports of late cytokine storm after 12 days but there are very few if the treatment is started early as mentioned above it is very unlikely patient will land up in complication again to reiterate it is the inflammation which kills and not the virus hit the inflammation hard and early and make the patient alive at least 2 weeks if you make him alive for 3 weeks you have made him alive from the covid onslaught body will automatically clear the virus prone ventilation for 18 hours a day it makes a big difference in hypoxic patient need to repeat ct chest up no, no need to repeat after baseline unless there is a clinical indication and deterioration cxr every 3 days may be sufficient to monitor pro- progress remember radiological changes take a lot of weeks and months to clear this is one important point all of us should know okay we have taken a ct and ct showed a score of 5 by 25 or 10 by 25 we discharge the patient patient says please do a ct and see whether my disease disappeared it doesn't disappear it doesn't disappear so soon because this is not a just a you know, consolidation there this is microthrombi so it takes a few weeks a month or two for the ct to clear so don't be panicky and uh, don't ask the patient to go by what the ct is there the patient may be uncomfortable with the ct being still uh, graded as abnormal so need to improve ma- monitor anything else once the oxygen starts improving oximetry is the guidance and the, at that time point 96 97 you don't have to do any monitoring further tocilizumab given keep monitoring procalcitonin that we have already discussed once tosi is given patient did not manifest fever he will not because tosi has suppressed immunity and then he may not have the uh, fever at all then the counts and the procalcitonin or your guide keep a low threshold for antibiotic for these people on tosi low threshold means what at the slightest suspicion you give yesterday a doctor mahendra was suggesting we better use anti i mean antibiotics when the patient is on steroid certainly keep a watch on that not empirically everybody will get but the slightest uh, indication is there you put them on uh, antibiotics broad spectrum antibiotics it might be better not to use antibiotic in mild cold covid illness patients will do absolutely well without antibiotic provided you keep changing the lines and taking care of the infection control protocols do not forget dexamethasone is highly probiotic so even if sugars are normal in the first week keep monitoring blood sugars regularly as long as the patients are on steroids 10 to 15% do not develop antibodies post covid what is this this is not good news suppose uh, 100 people have uh, suffered covid and then uh, 10 to 15% of people they do not mount immune response at all even at the end of 2 months you test the antibodies they will be negative okay there, there is there are no markers left of the viral onslaught in the body reason for it may be probably some true do not develop antibodies some have some t cell immunity and not an anti b cell immunity or some have immunoglobulin a antibody response from the respiratory mucosa local am antibody response and not a systemic antibody response uh, with the igg so in cases people who don't develop antibodies means either their body is taking care through the t cell 
or it is using immunoglobulin a locally and not immunoglobulin using the memory immunoglobulin the immunoglobulin g so post covid immunity is as a passport is invalid follow strict safety protocols post covid also to prevent reinfections and to infecting others so these are the nuggets from the kmc webinar so whatever the information i could gather from kmc aims and the protocol of the cmc international protocols everything we try to cover it is exactly we started at 9:40 now we are at 10:40 so we can stop sharing and any questions from the audience yes, good morning yes. good morning good morning sir good morning any questions still you have any questions thank you very much yeah uh, um uh taken us through a extensive journey this is a, it's a covid journey <laughs> and you have not left anything untouched and i think you have shown us the scope of the entire covid all scope of this covid all is in what is happening in the body uh, you are uh, uh, with all your efforts and your hard work here you brought out the important things and uh, the and the adequate respect the that my posted to the teacher or other person that is there but that is a, such a Difficult and uh, unavailable information for us, which you have brought us to near to us and made available to us. I thank you very much. This could have been not been done by us or by our students here. So we are lucky. We had a very extensive uh, knowledge gain from your all your talks, and uh, this will be hope our postgraduates will uh, use it uh, for their. Uh, A better understanding of the COVID patients. You know that their outlook should change. Before this talks, you were uh, presence in the ICUs. Now you are going to the ICU, and your outlook towards the patient should change. How you look at the patient, how you, what you expect from the patient, what is you are missing in the patient. All these things should um, be known to you. And I think I hope this uh, uh, extension will help you to bring out more information, better treatment for the um, benefit of the patient. Right. Thank you so much, sir.